My name is Andrea Fang. I am the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Fellowship Director at, Harbor, uh, at Stanford University. I did my emergency medicine training at Harbor UCLA and my fellowship there as well. Um, we have an illustrious panel of a huge variety. I forgot to take my, my Bluetooth. No one wants the big seat. We have an illustrious panel of people who have literally done almost every fellowship you can think of after residency, and so I want to say a few things. Firstly, maybe not everyone's going to get a chance to speak fully, but I have a handout with all their names and emails, or afterwards you can approach them privately and ask them questions. Um, in addition, we are going to let them all, I'll probably just pass the mic to speak about themselves for the next 15-ish minutes and just say what the pros and cons of doing fellowship is. I know that's a big question for especially the residents who come into SAEM because they have an interest in potentially staying in academics. And they're going to pitch maybe their specific fellowship and convince you why it's the best one um, for you. <laughs> and afterwards, we'll kind of open it up to questions, but. Uh, and we'll see how things go. Okay, the, what I have my experience with panels is that they fly really fast. So just we're going to go with it and steam ahead. Okay, uh, so I explain myself. My pitch to you is pediatrics is awesome. The key is you have to like the field that you do. Uh, I was very locationally driven when I graduated residency. I wanted to stay in California, and the Bay Area is a very hard market. And one thing I learned about being a pediatric an uh, EM trained PZM fellow is that the world is your oysters and job opportunities. So <laughs> that's all I'll say. Go ahead. Do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here. Can everyone hear me? Is it on? All right. Hi, I'm Martin Resnick. I am actually, I may be the only person here that's done two fellowships. I don't know if that's true or not. But I'm representing simulation today. Um, the strange part about that is I did my sim fellowship 20 years ago. Um, so things have changed since then. So are we sticking to the pre-questions that we got emailed, or you just wanted me to give a quick pitch? Okay, so, well, I think simulation is, so I went into it a long time ago before it really even existed in emergency medicine, and it has just blossomed since that time. I think the key to simulation and the interest in simulation, it really is the intersection of education and technology. So if both of those are in your wheelhouse, I think simulation is the way to go. Um, the nice piece about this is I do believe that you are all are the generation that are going to get touched by virtual reality and simulation. Um, my generation of sim, sim folks, that was not the case. Um, it's primarily mannequin simulation. But I think the technology will grow in your professional lifetime. So I think the technology piece of it will grow in the opportunities for education. Um, are we, would you like the keys to why to do a fellowship or save that? Okay. Um, I think for me, the reason to go into a fellowship is for professional diversity. Um, it is, we all hear about burnout out there, and I think one of the keys to burnout and mitigating that for yourself is to have some diversity in your professional career. So that doesn't pitch for any single fellowship, but I think that adds to it. The other piece to it is, is it does allow for leadership opportunity. So it puts you a step above the rest of the folks um, in terms of opportunities to get into leadership positions. And if that is of interest to you, I think it's a very important to do a fellowship. I'm John Fisher. I'm at University of Arizona in Maricopa now. Uh, this is my normal voice. I was not at the craps table too long last night. Um, so I, I actually have a little bit of a lie to tell you. I've actually never done a fellowship. I've run two different fellowships. I ran an education fellowship, and I was an EMS fellowship director for many years. Uh, but I'm going to save the education stuff for someone else, because I think we have another education member on the table. Um, I'm talking about EMS fellowship. I think the true advantage of an EMS fellowship is it gives you a whole new skill set, a whole new area of expertise, and sort of area to play in. And as Dr. Resnick said, it's, it gives you that ability to diversify your practice. It adds to resiliency, and it's just uh, the field. If you like EMS, it's a lot of fun. You know, most people think of EMS as uh, running around with lights and sirens and sort of being in that world, but EMS is really becoming a disruptive innovator in the delivery of health care outside of the hospital. And it's really become the sort of outside the hospital medical world. And there's all kinds of new innovative programs from, uh, from Centers for Medicare Services. Uh, the ET3 program that's allowing for 
all kinds of telemedicine integration in the EMS, and it just is all ability to do public health work. It actually has all different sort of facets. It's only sort of a microcosm of EM. You can do public health. You can do sort of disease prevention, injury prevention. You can do all kinds of amazing things. So uh, it's uh, definitely a great opportunity. Um, I'll pass on. Hi, I'm Ruthie Serene. I'm here to pitch disaster medicine to you, which I don't think needs much of a pitch. Um, I think a little bit of clarification helps. So if you want to do disaster, that doesn't mean just things like Las Vegas shooting, that doesn't mean just things like Ebola, that doesn't mean just things like Hurricane Harvey, that also means preparedness, planning, recovery phases, so it's how do you do that from a better angle and how do you get better at that. So you're going to get skill sets related to public health, osteo medicine, pre-hospital work, international field work, all sort of scrunched up in this little narrow area of focus of disaster preparedness, response, and planning. So I think it's really cool, but um, it's, a, it's a year or two of your life. and. It's a relatively new field, so it's growing. So if you go into it now, there's a lot of opportunity to help change it and shape it. Um, but it also means some of those career opportunities are a little bit nebulous and not as well defined as they are in some other specialties <laughs> after doing an emergency medicine residency. Hey, all. I am Melissa Gittinger, and so I'm here to pitch Med Talks, which, unlike disaster, probably needs a little bit of a pitch. Um, so I would dispel one rumor to say, first of all, you don't have to love chemical structures to be a toxicologist. Mm -hmm. I hate them, and I still did a tox fellowship. Um, so for me, I would agree um, with the fact that you got to find something that fits what you love. And for me, I did my talks rotation and turned out I loved it way more than any of my other co-residents, which is what led me to kind of examine it a little bit more. What I love about talks is it's not just the Tylenol overdose or the aspirin overdose. There's actually so much more to talks than the acute overdose. There's a lot of chronic exposures. There's a lot of population health. Um, and for me, one of the big things about talks when I was considering a career, I knew I wanted to do academics. I knew I wanted some subspecialty training, so I had a niche to kind of teach about and things like that. What I loved about talks is I love clinical medicine. I love taking care of patients at the bedside. Tox was one of the few specialties, though, that should personal or professional life circumstances change. I have a world of opportunities outside of clinical medicine where I can use my subspecialty training to work in industry or for the government or in consulting. I don't necessarily have to be seeing patients. I don't see that as a part of my future, but it does give me that flexibility if anything should change in the future where I can use that to do other work either in complement to my clinical work or just alone. And so that's what I loved about Tox. Um, and also just learning the basic pathophys of things, again, I feel made me a better emergency physician because if I understand how certain medications make when you have hypo or when you have hyperkalemia and I give you these medications and this is how it drives your potassium down, I will remember the side effects and things like that beyond tox overdoses. And so overall, I felt like it was a very broad specialty that helped me in my primary practice but also gives me options for the future should life circumstances ever change. So I'm Cray Bolger. I also didn't do a fellowship, so I was one of the last, um, I think, in our field who could get away with it. So I am um, the ultrasound fellowship director at Ohio State, and um, I think ultrasound fellowship gets kind of the, I don't need to do it because I get ultrasound training, and I would argue you do, because we teach you how to do clinical scans, but we don't teach you how to teach. We don't teach you to how to run a program. We don't teach you how to do good research primarily as a resident in a program. And so that's what ultrasound gives you is that extra niche. It does give you a career you can fall back on if you're like, I don't want to work that much clinically. About a third of my career right now is clinical, and the rest of it is teaching, education, and admin. And I love it. Um, and I can kind of, I like ultrasound because it doesn't have boundaries right now. So I play with the peds ICU. I play with the peds EM people. I play with the SICU, EMS. Like, I have no boundary, and I'm kind of that person who wants to play in all the sandboxes all the time. Um, and ultrasound's given me that door and kind of a niche to integrate with a lot of people and keep all my doors open. Um, it's only a year. It still is a valid clinical skill, so if after it you're like, thought I liked academics, not so much, you still have a skill you can take back to your clinical practice every day, um, which is really helpful, and you will have a better skill set. You can teach your patients, you can teach your colleagues, so even some of the people who maybe do ultrasound fellowships, they don't all go into academics. I never thought I was going to be an academic person, and 11 years later, here I am. Like, I plan on being full-blown community. Um, but I think that it really, it's becoming a field where now it's almost necessary to do a fellowship, um, especially to run a program. In the next year, we're going to have an accreditation process and be a much more formal kind of fellowship. And you will have to do one to have any street cred. And so I think 
it gives you a lot more than just the bedside skill that shouldn't be the focus of your fellowship and when you're looking for a fellowship don't look for how many ultrasounds am I going to do look for what else are you going to teach me beyond the clinical skill Thank you. I'm Stephanie Caden. I um, and I'm at Harvard University Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I'm a vice chair and the chief of the division of International Emergency Medicine. So I am I'm representing International Emergency Medicine Fellowships. I was our fellowship director for more than a decade, um, and the International Emergency Medicine Fellowships or Global Emergency Medicine Fellowships. Um, are typically <laughs> one year if you already have a Master of Public Health degree and two years if not because many of them will include that degree uh, in the fellowship which is one of its benefits. Now the academic practice of international emergency medicine is essentially two things. On the one hand we help to develop and improve the quality of emergency care around the world and that looks like developing EM societies and residency programs and training overseas and pre-hospital systems and so on. And on the other hand, we do humanitarian response. And that's like Doctors Without Borders type work. So responding to international disasters and refugee crises and war, there's also a little human rights work mixed into that. Both of those things are academic international emergency medicine. What it's not is emergency physicians who happen to go on a medical mission for a couple of weeks a year. That's not necessarily the academic practice of international emergency medicine, though of course many of our colleagues do engage in things like that. Um, so fellowship-wise, the pros of a fellowship are that uh, it provides protected time for you to get started with your global emergency medicine career as a junior faculty member. In global emergency medicine in particular, you need flexibility in your scheduling. And uh, it, is a, it is a myth that people pay you to work in other people's countries even in the academic setting. And so having this protected time early on in your career to get your research going and to get your programs off the ground is a huge benefit of fellowship. Um, the other huge benefit is that if you don't have a Master of Public Health degree, then the fellowships will typically pay for that or allow for that. And so that's also a huge benefit. The only caveat to these fellowships that I would really draw to mind is that they are, are very different from one another as a general rule. There's a lot of variety in what's offered by each of these fellowships. So you want to be sure that um, the thing that you want to focus on, whether it's EM development or humanitarian work, is something that's offered uh, in a strong way by the fellowship that you're looking at. And the place to start in your looking is uh, the website on which many of these, most of these fellowships are listed, which is iemfellowships.com. Uh, iemfellowships.com. And if you are looking for more information about fellowships and how you build a career in global emergency medicine, then this afternoon from 1 to 3 p.m., I'm going to give a shameless plug for the Global Emergency Medicine Academy's next meeting, where we are actually focusing on people just like you, on our trainees and junior <laughs> faculty. We're going to have um, two sessions there that are exactly relevant to this topic. One is we're going to talk about the brand new Global Emergency Medicine Career Roadmap. This is guidance for what you should be doing at each stage of your emergency medicine career if you want to go into global emergency medicine. That'll be the first part of our meeting. And the second part is going to be some speed mentoring on topics that are really germane to global emergency medicine, like how to find funding and how to achieve work-life balance when you're traveling all around the world all the time. So um, that's from 1 to 3 in Grand Ballroom B today if you want more information. I'm going to stand because I can't see everybody over on the left here. So my name is Niels Ratlev, and I'm chair at Bay State in Western Massachusetts. In my tenure at Bay State, we started six fellowships. And uh, I'm here today as the new chair of the Fellowship Approval Committee for SIM as of actually six hours from now. Um, I am also representing administrative fellowships, and we are teach you two very important things in administrative fellowships. The first is we teach you how to manage money. And as a resident or medical student, if you think that managing money is not important, just think about what's going to happen when you meet with your chair and try to negotiate a salary for your new job. Uh, for people like me, I have to negotiate with the CFO and try to get funding for all the great things that we do in our department. 
The second thing that we teach you, which is equally important, is how to manage people. And that's, those are things that you don't learn when you get an MBA. Uh, you don't learn that at Harvard Business School. Uh, think about all the great protocols and guidelines that we have for managing things like, say, workup of rule out PE. Uh, we have great guidelines for that, but we don't use them. At least we don't use them the way we should. And so this is uh, implementation science, human engineering, whatever you want to call it. This is about how you manage people. And this is something that um, I have had plenty of experience with in the past couple of years. Uh, so that's administrative fellowships. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Zamet. I uh, did my residency at Cincinnati in emergency medicine, obviously. I did a neurocritical care fellowship that was at New York Presbyterian. And now I'm up at the University of Rochester where I practice neurocritical care, emergency medicine, and also I do telestroke. Um, so obviously I'm here to talk to you about neurocritical care. Um, neurocritical care, is, it's a, it's a two-year fellowship um, um, after, obviously after residency. Um, their neurocritical care fellowships have a little bit different flavors where um, some of the fellowships are very much more critical care oriented than others. Um, and some of them also you learn a lot to do acute stroke, you have acute stroke responsibilities. Um, so if it's something you're considering um, for neurocritical care, those are some elements that um, I would look at um, and tease out of how much critical care time do you do, particularly what are your critical care responsibilities outside of a neurointensive care unit, um, and what are your acute stroke responsibilities. Um, for me, I was initially, I, I knew back when I was in medical school that I, I, I was probably going to do critical care after emergency medicine. Um, for me, I didn't discover neurocritical care until actually when I was interviewing and Cincinnati happened to be the, the place where they were first training emergency physicians in neurocritical care. That, that was how I first became attracted to it. The second layer of attraction for me was as I was rotating through the ICUs, um, frankly, there was something for, to me very powerful about the long-lasting impacts of acute neurologic injury on not just the patients but the families. Um, and it, and the, the field was very new. Um, it was still growing. Um, and it still is growing now um, in its science um, and what we can offer families in not just, not just helping them survive, but optimizing their functional recovery and reintegration into society, occupationally, socially, all those different domains that are really, really important to not just the patient, but again, to all of their families. Um, and I, I find that to be a hugely rewarding element of, of both thinking about the, the cerebral physiology, managing it, but then also sitting down talking to families and helping to counsel them about what to expect, here's what we think prognostically, those type of things. Um, professionally, it's, it's been, uh, it's been uh, hugely rewarding for me. I'm, I'm just finishing my fifth year out of fellowship. Um, there's a lot of already just immediate administrative functions that can come from having um, a neurocritical care training. Um, a lot of programs or, or, or facilities, hospital systems, are very eager to enhance the coordination of care for acute neurologic injuries, whether that's stroke, trauma, status epilepticus, cardiac arrest. Um, and so I, I found myself playing um, a significant role in that. Um, and just recently I was offered, um, offered uh, very fortunately, to, to serve as really the direct director for the hospital system um, on neurologic emergencies. Um, so it, it just kind of grew out of it and people found that, geez, this is a person who they know the pre-hospital environment, they know the critical care transport environment, they know the emergency department, and you know to most neurologists, the emergency department is a completely mysterious place that they try to avoid. Um, so it, you, you can, it really is, you can become quite empowering and really help, um, help programs to move forward um, with that. Um, the, the other element of it too is that actually I have the opportunity to actually attend in other intensive care units. I don't, <laughs> I don't just have the opportunity to work in the neuro ICU. Um, in the coming years, um, I'll be starting to attend in the cardiac ICU and the medical ICU uh, as well. Um, that's one of the things also I found very rewarding about neurocritical care. It's basically you come out of it being a, a, a full-fledged intensivist, but then you have this expertise training in EEG, neuroimaging, um, again, acute neurologic injury, all those elements um, of, of critical care. So if you, if you go about it right and you tailor it right, you can actually come out of the back end actually being pretty pleiotropic within the critical care world and then having significant roles with, with acute stroke in your institution. Um, and of course, there's a tons going on right now from a research perspective, uh, a lot of clinical trials um, that, that are occurring, um, lots of our areas to be involved with that. So there's plenty of, plenty of research opportunity as well. 
And uh, I'll wrap it up. I'm Ben Schnapp from the University of Wisconsin, here representing medical education. Uh, I don't feel like I have to do a ton of pitch uh, to you guys about this, because I know you guys have all been exposed to residency education uh, before. But uh, you know, I think medical education can be um, more than that uh, as well. You can uh, do medical student education, or you know, what people think about less is continuing uh, education. So uh, you know, educating other physicians on best practices and uh, things like that. Um, I think it's amazing. I can't believe that. Uh, uh, they pay me uh, to, to do some of the things that I would be wanting to do in terms of educating anyway. Um, but I think one of the things that maybe people don't necessarily realize or appreciate about medical education is that it's really an administrative job more than it is a, uh, an education uh, job. Any faculty member can teach residents, any faculty member can lecture, uh, but somebody's got to make sure all the boxes are checked and uh, you know all the curriculum is, uh, is right to uh, make sure that the residency program can continue to run and uh, you know meets all the requirements to, uh, to continue to be a residency program. So that and those sorts of things uh, end up taking up a, a large portion of our uh, our, our day in the, uh, in the education realm. Um, but I think it's, it's very interesting work. It's very challenging work. Um, it, it reminds me a lot of emergency medicine, but just from a, uh, you know, a very different, uh, different standpoint of here, you've got uh, these, these challenges and with residents or in training scores or you know, whatever the challenge of the day is, and, and you've got to help figure out a, a solution. And I think it's, uh, it's very, uh, it's cool work. Um, as far as why for uh, fellowship, you know, I don't, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that uh, fellowship is the only way to get where you're going uh, within medical education. My co-APD uh, walked right into his uh, assistant program director position with no fellowship at all. He's great. He's wonderful. Um, I did the fellowship route, and you know, I think it really paid some benefits for me personally. Um, I was able to get a master's degree. Uh, was able to. Um, kind of have a little bit more of that protected time that I think some of these other folks have, have talked about to uh, do a little bit more dedicated scholarship, explore some areas of medical education uh, that I hadn't delved into quite as uh, in-depth before. So a little bit of just personal time for, for career development and just in-depth mentorship. Um, but I also think it's a really nice uh, career tool for me. I looked at both options of the non-fellowship and the fellowship option and, you know, there were other places out there that were like, yeah, you know, we'll, we can get you in teaching and you can kind of work your way into residency education, you know, when spots <laughs> open up. And for me, I knew that was what I wanted to do right off the bat, right out of residency. And uh, the idea of kind of waiting or, you know, seeing how it goes uh, wasn't particularly appealing to me. So uh, the opportunity to do a fellowship was the opportunity to hit the ground running and, and start uh, you know, diving into to this stuff that I was really interested in right away, and then coming out of fellowship, having that immediate cachet of like, wow, you've really done some deep work on this, and you know, you're gonna you're gonna do great when you uh, when you start up your first job. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I think this is a really interesting perspective for me, um, and so we're gonna open it up now to questions. Do any of you guys have any questions right now? Yes. Uh, and I will repeat them just so you know for our recording individuals who aren't here. So. <laughs> Yes, in the back, middle back. Yes, please have um, In absence in, uh, of questions right now, I, I did, um, not to rebut my esteemed colleague from Wisconsin, but um, 
as somebody that hires into and recruits into my department, um, so I also did an administrative fellowship, and that's my primary role at this point. Um, I do think that the workforce within academic medicine has the potential to shrink over time if you look at the healthcare economics environment. And so while it was true, at least when I went into simulation, anybody could do it, um, and you just sort of got in, if you showed interest, you became the simulation director for your department. That's no longer true. And so I do think that there are these stories of folks that come within their own department get cachet within their department, show interest, and sort of build up within their own department. But very hard to move departments unless you have some background expertise experience in that area. And I think that that's only going to get more significant as we move forward. So I do believe that there is value in fellowships for that reason, that if you want to go into academic medicine and you want to potentially move out of the department that you're in currently and move across country, you're going to have to have that. And a, or a fellowship that you've completed will help you with that in terms of recruitment from another department. So I think I think the job market is going to get tighter, um, is my opinion. And, um, I'm going to take your question if that's okay. Is that okay? I think the question was how do you how do you balance your desire to educate and also an interest in a, a specific field? So I. I think there's two potential answers, um, and either of them could be potentially right, depending on where you really want to house yourself. I would say medical education tends to put you a little bit more, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, into like curriculum design and development and more of the administrative side of medical education. Um, you have to find an ultrasound program that has or wants to have a strong medical, medical student education program. Um, I would say like, I allow my fellows, if they want to do a second year, to do a master's in education as part of their ultrasound fellowship um, in conjunction with our med ed. So we've worked together a lot. We work together with our global health. So if you're like, I love ultrasound and global health, we make that work. Um, I think generally speaking, except for some of the ACGME fellowships where there's more rigid guidelines, we tend to be a fluid group where we'll try to make these hybrid custom programs for you so that you are happy. Like that's really my goal for my fellows is to find their niche within, even within ultrasound, you can be the med ed person, you can be the resident person, you can do CME, you can be policy and administrative. Like there's a lot of niches within our fellowships individually as well. And so we try to figure out what part of our fellowship fits for you to make you have the best possible career. And that's fluid too, right? You may come in and be like, what, one of my fellows was like, I never want to teach a medical student ever. Cool. She likes her spreadsheets and admin, and she loves sending emails. Lovely, right? Like, I, she still has to teach people because that's part of the fellowship, but I try to give her more of that work. And so a lot of us don't have these rigid curriculums. We meet our mandatory requirements, but then we try to customize it to be what you want. So I kind of danced around. I can't tell you which one's right for you, but I think that you have to find a program that's going to offer you a experience in what you're interested in within that fellowship. And I went. <laughs> I would also, can I make a plug for RAMS? RAMS made this amazing roadmap project that they worked with all the academies and they um, sent it to all the leadership of the academies on like, if I'm a student and I want to do a fellowship, if I'm a resident and I want to do a fellowship, once I'm a fellow, what does that look like? And this amazing, beautiful roadmap project I highly encourage you to look at that really talks you through each of the fellowships from the leaders in the field's point of view with a kind of bend towards the various learner levels. I mean, I have a question for some of you. Um, when I was deciding to do a fellowship, I was very torn between doing a SIM fellowship, an education fellowship, a pediatrics fellowship, and actually really debated going back into the community or being a community physician. And one of the reasons I was very drawn to pediatrics was because I felt I could still be a pediatrician pediatric emergency medicine physician in the community if that was an option that I wanted for myself and it was highly desirable. Are there any fields that you feel can blend towards both of those? If they want, if maybe some of these applicants or residents here are torn between whether they truly want to go in academics or are a little on the fence, but maybe want to have a niche that would be a great driver in, in the community as well. So uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. I think that there are two fellowships that particularly lend themselves well to practice in the community. The first is ultrasound, so I'll speak for ultrasound. 
Just about every community practice uh, needs an expert in ultrasound. Some may have them, but uh, probably don't have state-of-the-art equipment or processes for using ultrasound. And uh, maybe they learned a couple of years ago, but are still not up to date. So I think that coming out of an ultrasound fellowship really will give you a leg up uh, negotiating with a future employer about, say, academic time to teach everybody uh, ultrasound in a community practice and also doing CQI. And we've certainly seen a number of our ultrasound fellows do that. And the other thing, and I'll put a plug in again for administration, and uh, <coughs> some of you, if you are interested potentially in leadership positions as a vice chief or chief in a community practice, uh, you need to know all the same things that you need <laughs> to know to be a chief in an academic practice, and you still need to know how to manage people, which I'll get back to again, which is what we do all day long, and you need to know how to manage the finances. So I think those are two things to really think about. So quickly, we, there's, oh, there's not that much room on this stage, but there, if you go to the SAM website, there's over 25 different kinds of fellowships with lots of hybrid models that sort of span different things. So if you're interested in a, you know, you're doing between education or simulation or ultrasound or trying to take a look at the fellowship, see how flexible it is to allow you, and you know, you may end up picking an ultrasound fellowship at one place because it's really flexible and it will allow you to do that teaching side, as such as Ohio State talked about, versus, oh, maybe at this institution, the better way to do it is through medical education. And that's just going to be sort of based on how the fellowship works. But really, fundamentally, it's about what you want your identity to be. Do you want to be an ultrasound expert or do you want to be an education expert? And who your people are, right? So are, do you like hanging out with the ultrasound folk or do you like hanging out with the education <laughs> folk? And sort of work your way back into that. Um, but in terms of fellowships, I think actually every fellowship has a role in the community place. Every hospital needs a disaster person. Every hospital needs an EMS person. Every hospital needs X person. There's some that are a little bit more niche focused, but pretty much there's <laughs> plenty of flexibility out there. Um, I think the advantage of getting a fellowship and then going into the community, it gives you that chip or that coin or proof you're an expert in it and someone else says it, not just because you say it. I realize we've kind of left the question behind uh, a little bit now, but I do think that's a really important point to, to emphasize that I didn't necessarily appreciate when I was out there looking for fellowships, uh, the extent to which fellowships are, are really very different uh, and, and you know, sometimes vastly so. So, you know, my experiences within medical education, some of them are basically entirely focused around undergraduate medical education, so medical students. Um, I might really like um, a certain geographic location or a certain institution and really want to work there. But you know what? If my interest is graduate medical education, I want to work with residents, and the focus of their uh, fellowship is on uh, medical students, that's not going to be a good match. Um, it's not like residency where the ACGME kind of keeps all the residency programs relatively similar to one another, like you're kind of going to learn the same thing at residency A, B, C, and D. Uh, fellowship is not like that at all. So um, really, it's not just a, looking for a geographic match for yourself, but also like really trying to, to delve into like, well, what are, what are they going to give you? What are they going to, you know, is there time for a master's? Are they going to pay for the master's? Because uh, the, none, none of it can be assumed, I guess. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, um Great comments so far. This is awesome. Um, the I, I do I, I want to provide a little bit of a different perspective, in my opinion, on uh, fellowship decision making. Um, it, in my opinion, I think that I think that we're all as you as for those who are residents, <coughs> presumably that's what, who we're speaking to right now. As you're choosing a fellowship, you're choosing to develop another skill set that you're going to continue to 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 use and to and to need and to evolve over a career that hopefully will last 25 or 30 years after your training. Like, like thinking that you know what your career is going to look like in 10 years after you finish your fellowship is, uh, you don't want to be that inflexible. You want to be open-minded. Um, and hence, to me, that's, that's the crux of uh, evolution, of emergency medicine of, of a, as a specialty, and the plethora of fellowship options that even that we just mentioned. If we, we have created over 20 fellowships, like just out of other skill sets that are important to
to the practice of emergency medicine and the delivery of health care out of emergency medicine. These are not even EBMS recognized specialties in a lot of, in a lot of, a lot of cases. These are skill sets that are useful and that will help you to need your career. I actually would um, actually offer opposite advice. I don't think you should care if you like the other people who do what you do or not. That's, you're going to be subject to very local personalities. And the personalities across the country are going to be very different. And the way you move a field forward is through diversity, challenging, and, and differences. And so if you, if, you, if you end up just keep gravitating all these same people who are all like-minded and you like them because they're all similar thinking, there's gonna, not going to be a lot of agility and diversity and, and growth in your career. Like, I mean, even for me, just five years out, I'm doing all kinds of things that I did not plan on doing five years ago, and it's all cool stuff. And I, and I, and I foresee this continuing to grow. Um, and even the way my perspective on things as I gain more experience, I become, I became more and more of, okay, how can I use this skill set? What opportunities are out there? And so <laughs> it, 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 makes, it makes your career fun. Um, it, th that, is, that is what's really fun is having this extra skill set that you can then apply in all these different ways and help your specialty grow, help yourself grow, and help enhance the, the healthcare delivery wherever you work. Questions, yes. The question is, should there be a gap year between residency and fellowship? <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody would have different opinions on this. I think a lot of it's going, so I did not take a gap year. I mean, I went from kindergarten through umpteen millionth grade. Um, <laughs> but I, I will say, I think it depends on your personal circumstance. So for me, going from residency to fellowship and knowing the fellowship that I was going to do, I knew that if I took a year off, just and not off, there are plenty of other things that you're doing. You're gonna be quite busy during that gap year, but I knew just the academic mindset that I was in and studying for boards and studying for other things, it would be hard for me personally to restart that because I just know how I work. And I also know the one thing I would caution and the best advice my program director in residency gave me was, um, and gave all of our classes was, especially if you're planning on going back into training, but probably for the first five years out, try not to live like an attending. So what I mean by that is if you go out and you take your gap year or two or things like that, don't buy the half million dollar house in the $90,000 car, because it's gonna be really hard when you go back to a fellow salary to change that mindset and change those type of things. So I think if there are life circumstances that that makes sense for you, I don't think it's difficult to go back. So I'm one of the, um, I'm the clerkship director for the fellowship or for the medical toxicology clerkship at Emory, um, and then also I'm on the fellowship selection committee. And we have plenty of applicants that are either straight through residency. We have some that are coming out of <laughs> several years in practice. We have one that's been practicing that's applying this year that's been practicing for 10 years. And we don't view them differently. I just think the adjustment personally may be a little bit different rather than going straight through and still being in that academic mindset. So it depends on what works for you. Um, I agree with that statement m mostly. I will say when we look at folks um, in all of the fellowships, um, if you take in a gap year, you better have a good story behind it. Um, there, it always just raises a quick eyebrow. Right or wrong, that's just reality. So I'm not advocating against it at all, but I think you just have to have a good story of why. And if it's like, I, hey, I was undecided at that point, didn't want to commit, but now I'm really committed because of X, and this is what I figured out. That's a great story. It's a good cover letter. I think the committee, uh, the selection committee will buy into that. So I, I'm not advocating against or for, just build a good story behind that, um, and I think that it's worthwhile. Um, and I will second because it's super important. Don't get used to a lifestyle because I've watched this with my trainees and residents. Really hard to come back, um, and you're going to take a hit, and it's just hard to do. So, and I would add to that, I actually debated doing a gap year too between residency and fellowship because I was a little torn, as you can tell, and um, and I was actually also physically exhausted from residency, as I'm sure many of you guys can understand too. And um, I realized if I had to do a gap year, it was uh, in part to recollect myself, maybe pay off some loans, but, and I wasn't 100% decided to do a fellowship, but I think the key is A, the circumstance. So if I have a spouse who's, you know, needs another year of training, then that absolutely makes sense. Um, but if it's a gap year and you're still on the side, you need to realize, I did not have, I would not, I realized I would not have had any extra time to debate if I wanted to do the fellowship, because you apply almost immediately after you graduate. So just realize that mental break is not necessarily going to be there if that's the reason. It really depends on your reason. Yeah, please. So 
So I actually have two faculty members that after having been in uh, academic practice for 10 years <laughs> plus went back and did ultrasound fellowships with us and we figured out how to do that. They were really motivated to become experts at ultrasound, have stayed on as ultrasound faculty after that. So there are ways uh, that you can do this if you have uh, an innovative um, ultrasound director and chair who are willing to work with you. As a fellowship director, I actually don't mind if you have some experience between. I actually, it's easier because I'm not, you're not in shell shock that first year of being an attending. You're not like, help me not kill people. I don't have to deal with that part of your life. I just have to teach you ultrasound. So that part's kind of nice is that you tend to have a little bit maturity. You tend to have some confidence, um, more maturity. You're mature people-ish. Um, <laughs> It, but you have that ability. So one of my fellows recently had worked in the community for several years and came back. And it was actually really nice because I just had to teach them ultrasound. And I didn't have to check on them from a systems standpoint. Like they adjusted to the workflow and the clinical side much better. Um, but keep in mind that you're not going to have that reduced shift typically that you're going to get. Like in residency, like there are people mentoring you and you have letters and all of that. So think about that if you're going to take a gap year. Think about building up that portfolio before you leave. Because when you're in the community, finding letters of support from your ultrasound director, you don't necessarily have that in your hand. Um, and it's not impossible. But think about that part of it, um, all the things you're going to need for your fellowship before you step away from the academic world, um, which residency tends to like give you some ins. Um, that you might lose a little bit of stepping away. So I think it has benefits because you your fellowship then is fully focused on your fellowship and not also being a doctor at the same time. So just one more follow-up comment on that. So <coughs> when I was going to fellowship, I was really nervous about that idea of like, oh, if I didn't go straight into a fellowship, I could never go back into academia, right? People tell you just go straight through and then make your decision afterwards if it's not for you. Um, I went straight through, but one of my colleagues, one of my co-fellows in disaster medicine, was 25 years senior to me. He had done disaster medicine, he, sorry, he'd done emergency medicine, he'd gone off and worked in the pre-hospital world before pre-hospital and EMS was a fellowship. He'd been the director for a hospital pre-hospital system in the Virgin Islands, and he came back to do a fellowship because of the primary purpose of doing a fellowship is to build academic credibility, to learn how to do research, to publish in the field, to be someone who shapes a field and makes it progress and move forward, and he wanted to expand the work he was doing beyond the space he was in and wanted to integrate in more international systems and know what he didn't know essentially from what's been growing and developing in terms of best practices. So there are reasons to do a fellowship and so that should shape why you would come back to a fellowship if you take time off after residency. We have time for probably these last two. Keep going. Ooh, questions about staying at your own institution versus trying something new. So to answer that question, so I did my residency in, in Indianapolis at IU, and then I did my fellowship at Emory. Um, and IU does have a toxicology fellowship, and I loved the toxicologist there. Um, for me, it was a really difficult decision. One, there's the comfort of I already had a home. I knew everybody there. I knew the system. Um, what it came down to for me was, and again, with the caveat of I had no idea what my career would look like now, five years out of fellowship. But with what I saw my career looking like, there were unique things at different fellowships that drew me away to a different program. So for example, the reason I trained at IU, or the reason I trained at Emory, was my kind of three niches that I like in my career and that I go forward for are toxicology, emergency medicine, and then advocacy. And the program at Emory has a unique niche, just very briefly, where it's a toxicology year for the first year, but the second year you work for the CDC and do public health things. And so for me, that connection with government and public health was what drove me to choose Emory. And it was an uncomfortable decision, and it was difficult to move, but getting that extra training was helpful. And also for me, just from an emergency medicine perspective, when I did my attending shifts as a fellow, it was kind of nice to see, there's about, these are not real numbers, but there's about 50% of medicine that is science-based, and this is why we do this, and these are our protocols. And then there's a lot of medicine that is the art of medicine. So if I had stayed at my institution, I think I would have practiced one way because that's how IU does it, and a lot of people trained there and are continuing to train others. Having the unique opportunity of training for my residency in one place, training for my fellowship in another, and then actually for three years after fellowship working at a different institution across the country 
really gave me a unique perspective on that art of medicine piece, whether it was toxicology or emergency medicine, and kind of, I feel, made me more well-rounded. And when you get those bizarre scenarios that present to the ER or whatever your subspecialty is, you just have more tools to kind of attack it from different angles because you've seen many different institutional ways of doing things. So for me, that worked. Um, but again, there's also personal reasons that drive you to be in one location or another. So I think all of those things add up, and depending on where your priorities lie, I don't think there's a wrong answer for training either at your home institution or elsewhere. Yeah, actually, I, I'm going to echo that a little bit, but actually, um, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that, that if you're considering a fellowship, you should really look outside of where you did your residency. Um, for a lot of the reasons that were said, there were, there, were, there were skills, perspectives, practices, cultures, so many things that I was exposed to that were very new and I never would have gotten if I stayed at my same location. And I'll be honest, additionally, from a, from a opportunity standpoint for academic opportunities, um, the, the pool of people that I collaborate with, that I bounce ideas off of, is so much bigger now because of that. And even, even when I, frankly, even when I was a fellow, there are times where I'd be like, we'd be doing something, and I'm like, man, this doesn't feel right. So I call back my, my, one of my attendings from where I did residency and be like, hey, I got this case. What do you think about this? And of course, I wasn't asking to directly challenge the person who was supervising me at the time. But, but I, still even, I still even went back to where I did residency and just made a phone call to compare and contrast what they would say versus what I, what I was doing there. Just, just, a, just a, even in real time, I still was benefiting from both pools. Uh, both pools of it. In fact, my, actually, my first job after I finished my fellowship was back where I did my residency. I, I, I still end up going back there, and if anything, they actually found it to be a strength that I had now been able to diversify the pool of people who were practicing neurocritical care at, at that at that location. Um, so, I, if 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 it's within your life means, um, you know, meaning you don't have a reason you have to stay geographically limited, I would I strongly suggest considering opportunities outside of where you did your residency for that diversification piece. Mm -hmm. Last question on the side there. In regards to like staying versus going, I think too you have to. It, networking is huge. Um, also, our networks are pretty small in the grand scheme of things. So keep that in mind. Don't burn bridges um, if you're leaving your institution because this is like this is a family. Like that's the beauty of a fellowship is it becomes your work family. Like I look forward to coming to conferences to see my people, um, and I think leaving is really good. Um, from the new perspective standpoint, but the, there is a benefit to staying that you can start your fellowship early. You can, if you want to do original research, you can, but you have to make sure your home institution, you're not staying just because these are the people who like cultivated that desire and love of the field for you. You want to find a place that has the right fit for you. So if somebody was like, I want to do a lot of clinical ultrasound research, I would say, you shouldn't stay with me. Like, I would be very open with that person because that's not our niche. Our niche is education and ultrasound. And I think you need to know what each fellowship brings. And just because the people are the people who kind of, like, raised you doesn't mean that that's what's best for you. And if you have a good mentor and advisor, they're going to push you out of the nest and not let you stay in the nest um, because that's what's best for you. And you can always come back and bring back that skill set to your institution. Um, but it does build your network. It builds your... Um, community by leaving and I think you have to kind of weigh those pros and cons as far as like do they have what I need 
could I come back? Do I have a career here afterwards too? Because a lot of people use fellowship as kind of like opening the door for your like life goals. And do you want to stay here long term? Do they have a space for me? Um, academics is not an indefinite pool, right? Like there are only so many slots at an institution. And if there's not a spot opening up, do you want to be somewhere that you have to then get another job after you've got yourself comfortable with the system? Okay, we are out of time, but I want to thank all you guys for coming as well as the panelists. We have the room in theory for two more minutes. Actually, no, we don't. But the next group comes in technically at the hour. So if any of you guys were a little shy before and want to approach any of us, we will come down to ground level with you. And you are welcome to come talk to us as individuals. But thank you so much for coming, everyone.